Hello everyone, in the last video I talked about registers and how we use them to configure our microcontroller. And in this video, I'll talk about specific type of registers called configuration registers, which are used to change the microcontroller's behavior, usually in a big way. So, let's get started. You should know about registers now, and you should know that these registers can be written to in your program to configure certain things that you need. However, there are special registers that you cannot directly write onto in your main code. These are called configuration registers, or config registers for short. Configuration registers, which are also commonly referred to as configuration bits, lay in a part of your microcontroller that is not accessible by your program, meaning you can't change these registers in runtime. Instead, they are configured directly by your programmer before your main program is loaded. By the way, runtime refers to any and all program that is executable while the microcontroller is running. These bits usually change the microcontroller's behavior in a big way, so they are important and should be handled before you start writing your code. They open or close circuitry that will enable or disable some hardware features as well. As for which registers to configure, you can look at your datasheet by searching configuration bits, like this, and you'll find a list of all the configuration bits. But there's a better way that doesn't involve looking at the datasheet. In this first example project, I've already configured these bits of course, which reside in the config.h file as you may guess. If you look at that file, you'll see all these pragma terms. Pragma is used to inform the compiler about how it should handle certain things. These are not defined by C and are instead specific to your compiler. I've said that these configuration bits are not accessible by your program. That is exactly why we use these pragma terms. You can see that pragma is used with a hash symbol, meaning it is meant for the preprocessor, so it can inform the compiler to configure these bits. This is needed again because these bits are not accessible by your main program, so the compiler has to be informed prior to it. This block of code may look overwhelming, but I didn't actually write any of this. This is automatically generated by the IDE. To do this, navigate to production, then set configuration bits. This will open up a list of configurable bits for you to change graphically. Configuration bits are different for each microcontroller, but this page will automatically show you the configurable bits for your project's selected microcontroller. This is also why you don't have to check the datasheet. Everything configurable for your selected microcontroller will be listed here. I know it's hard to see because of dark mode, but you can click on the spaces to highlight them, or zoom in by holding control and using scroll wheel. Before we continue, note that changing these bits will not affect the microcontroller. This tab is only used to generate the code that will affect the microcontroller. Now, these configuration bits are not standard, meaning not every microcontroller will have the same bits. Since this microcontroller has all of the common ones, I'll only explain the ones that are listed here. But if you use another microcontroller in the future and stumble upon a different configuration bit, a simple datasheet or Google search should give you the explanation you're looking for. Let's go through these bits one at a time. First bit is FOSC, which stands for Frequency of the Oscillator. It tells you its purpose on the category part. You can use the option list here to change the value for this bit or instead use the setting list here, which will have explanations for each option as well. You can also see the value to be loaded onto this bit in the value part. Don't be confused by the value being higher than one. FOSC is a four bit long configuration, even though we're calling it a configuration bit. Every option will also belong to a tab like this. From here, you can see the name of the register that this bit belongs to, as well as its address and the total value that will be loaded onto the register. The total value is different than the value of the bits. Don't forget that what we're configuring here are groups of bits that reside within this register. I talked about all this in the previous video. Now, I'll skip explaining this FOSC, since I'll talk about it in the next video, which will be about the oscillator. I'll just select the internal oscillator option for now and move on. And when you update something, it will be highlighted like this, so you know which bits you already configured. Next up is PLLCFG, which stands for PLL Configure. This is also about oscillators, which again is what the next video will be about, so I'll just select on and skip it. Next up is PRICLKEN, which stands for Primary Clock Enable. This is also about oscillators, so I'll choose on and skip it. Next up is FCMEN, which stands for Fail Safe Clock Monitor Enable. This bit is used to switch between external and internal clocks should the external clock fail. This is used when you are using an external clock source that may be prone to failure, in which case, if this bit is enabled, the microcontroller will automatically switch to internal clock if it detects a failure from the external clock. And this switching can be detected by software as well to take precautions. These are all application specific, but I'll disable it since it's a very niche option and I won't be using an external clock. 
Next up is IESO, which stands for Internal External Switchover. This feature is used for faster startup when using an external oscillator. If you use an external clock source like a crystal to run your oscillator circuit, your microcontroller will have some delay before startup, which is needed by the external oscillator circuit to stabilize itself. But if you enable this bit, the microcontroller will use its internal oscillator while the external oscillator circuit stabilizes, then automatically switch to the external oscillator, which allows the microcontroller to start up faster. I won't enable it since I won't be using an external oscillator anyways. Next up is PWRTEN, which stands for Power Up Timer Enable. When enabled, whenever your microcontroller starts up or resets, there will be a 72 milliseconds delay before the microcontroller starts running. This delay is generated internally, so your oscillator source doesn't matter. I recommend having this option off for all cases, unless you really need that microcontroller to start up as fast as possible. When you first power your circuit and the voltage isn't stable yet, the microcontroller may behave erratically, especially if you have high power circuitry connected to the same supply. This delay makes the microcontroller wait for a bit before starting, which gives time for the power rails to stabilize. I'll have it enabled just in case. Next up is BORN which stands for Brownout Reset Enable. This feature makes the microcontroller stay in reset whenever the voltage goes below a certain threshold. This is application specific, so I can't really say to turn it on or off. In older microcontrollers, the voltage threshold is usually preset, but for newer chips like these, you can set this voltage using the next configuration bit, which is BORB. You can also choose to enable or disable it when sleeping. Sleeping refers to the mode you can put your microcontroller into to have it consume less power when there's nothing to do. The SBOREN written here is used to enable or disable the brownout reset, meaning if you select this option, you can enable or disable it during runtime. I'll just enable it in hardware only and set the voltage to 2.5 volts. But before we continue further, I want to show you something. Say you didn't know what this SBOREN meant, or what any of these options meant for that matter. How would you find out about it? Well, there's always the option of googling these terms, but not all microcontrollers will have the same hardware, so a better way would be to consult the datasheet. Usually, there will be a section explaining each feature. Know that, when viewing datasheets, Ctrl and F will be your best friend. To know what the SBORN bit does, just search the exact name like this. You'll find multiple matches, but keep searching until you find the one that gives you a description for it, whether it be a dedicated paragraph or just the register explanation itself. You immediately see that this option enables or disables the brownout reset feature. Now, you can look up the brownout reset feature itself, and like I said, almost every feature will have a dedicated part in the datasheet for its explanation. And there it is. You can immediately see the part for software enabled brownout reset here. If you want to know more about each feature, you can use the same method to read through their dedicated sections in the datasheet. There will always be more to what I can explain here, and things will be different between each microcontroller as well. So get used to using this Ctrl and F feature on the datasheet as well. Next up are these two bits, WDTEN and WDTPS. These are watchdog timer related bits, which I'll talk about in a separate video. But to put it simply, it causes the microcontroller to reset if you don't reset a timer periodically, which is used as a measurement in case the microcontroller gets stuck in an infinite loop. I'll disable it for now, but again, I'll talk about it further in another video. Next up is CCP2MX which stands for Capture Compare 2 MUX. This bit is used to make Capture Compare 2 modules I.O. multiplex with either RB3 or RC1 pins. Which pin you choose depends on which pin you want to use. If you want to use this functionality on RB3, then choose RB3, and vice versa. I won't use this functionality anyway, so it doesn't really matter what I choose here. Next up is PBADEN, which stands for Port B Analog or Digital Enable. We'll talk about this in the future, but when a pin is configured as analog, it can't be used as digital, and vice versa. You can configure pins to be analog or digital in your program, but this bit gives you the option to have it done automatically. This is telling you that the pins from RB0 to RB5 will be either configured as analog or digital, depending on your choice by default. I'll choose the digital option. Next up is CCP3MX. This is the same deal as the CCP2MX from before, but for Capture Compare 3 module instead. Next up is HFO-FST, which stands for High Frequency Oscillator Fast Startup. When you turn this feature on, the oscillator will immediately start clocking the microcontroller without waiting for the clock to stabilize. And if you turn this bit off, the microcontroller will be kept in reset until the clock stabilizes. I suggest turning this on, but it's up to you. These next two bits are also about multiplexing, so I'll just skip them again. 
Next up is MCLRE, which stands for MCLR Enable. Like I said before, MCLR is used to reset your microcontroller externally, but if you don't need this feature and need more inputs for your application, you can configure it as I.O. as well, which will turn it into RE3 pin. But be careful, MCLR pins are input only when configured as I.O., so you can't use it as an output. Also, if you're curious, disabling MCLR doesn't affect programming. You'll still be able to program your microcontroller, but to properly use it as an input, you may need to disconnect the programmer. Next up is STVREN, which stands for Stack Overflow Reset Enable. Stack is a storage place that contains the program locations prior to jumping to another call. For example, say your main program has a function call. You would expect the program to continue from where it left off after the function is executed, right? The stack is where this program location would be stored, and you can call more functions in the called function and so on as well. But the stack is limited in hardware, and the word hardware here is important, but I won't go any deeper into this. Because the stack is limited, the amount of calls you can make are also limited. If you exceed this limit, microcontroller will start behaving erratically, and this configuration bit allows the microcontroller to be reset if you run out of stack storage. I'll enable this feature and move on. Next up is LVP, which stands for Low Voltage Programming. We are currently using what is called High Voltage Programming, or HVP in short. So LVP is an option and not a necessity. I'll disable this feature for now since I don't use it, but I'll eventually make a dedicated video on it. Next up is XINST, which stands for Extended Instruction Set Enable. The extended instruction set unlocks more instructions for the CPU and adds more options to the existing instructions as well, but you don't have to worry about any of it since the XC8 compiler doesn't support them. You won't be able to compile your code if you turn this feature on. It seems Microchip decided that it was not worth it to change the compiler to utilize these extended instructions, and since this option changes the existing instructions as well, you are forced to turn this option off or you won't be able to compile your code. The rest of the options are used to protect external reading or writing to certain parts of your code, but they would be mainly for companies. If you are an individual, and especially a beginner one, you won't need these options. But if you want to know more about them anyway, I'll put a link down below for an official explanation. And with that, we are done with the configuration bits. And like I said in the beginning, changing these options here won't actually change them for your microcontroller. This page is used to create the code that will change your microcontroller. To get this code, you can click this button down here. Copy all of the code, then create a new header file. You can name it anything, but I like naming it config for obvious reasons. You'll see these C++ and extern C lines, which you can delete as well, since we won't have anything to do with C++. Now we can paste the generated code in the middle, and there you go. You'll also see the xc.h being included here. You can keep this or remove it and include it explicitly in your files. It's up to you. I prefer the latter, so I'll remove it from here. You'll also see two notes here. It's telling us that the config statements should precede other includes. This is to avoid any conflict that may occur between header files. You won't necessarily break anything if you don't follow this, but it's recommended that you do. And the second line is telling you to use enums instead of define when using on and off statements to avoid conflict with this header, since this header file is also using on and off statements. But this is not really a concern when using multiple files in the project like this. And of course, you need to include this file on your main source file as well. And that's the end of the video, and thank you for watching. If you liked the video, you can always leave a like and subscribe. It's always appreciated, and I'll see you in the next video.